Hello and welcome to today's webinar, How to Simplify Disaster Recovery of Enterprise Databases with Modern Data Management. This special webinar event is brought to you in partnership with Rubrik and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media and I'm glad to be serving as your moderator. Thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. We've got a really great presentation lined up for you today and a really a well-spoken speaker on this topic. So some great content. Uh, the goal here, of course, is to get all your questions answered and to help you learn how to simplify disaster recovery of your enterprise databases. We want this, of course, to be an educational event as we do with all of our events here at Actual Tech Media. I encourage you to use the questions pane. It's there in your audience console, right next to the handouts tab. You'll see the word questions. If you click on that, that's where we encourage you to drop in your questions on today's topic. We have our best question prize that we're running as well to help shake loose some of those questions that might be on your mind and you're kind of on the fence as to whether you should ask those. Uh, hopefully the best question prize will help to encourage those. We have a number of resources there in the handouts tab as well, a link to rubric.com as well as the rubric build site for more information. And then finally here on the live event, we're doing our Amazon $300 gift card door prize which I'll announce at the end of the webinar. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms can be found there in the handouts tab. As I mentioned, we've got our best question prize. That's for a $50 Amazon gift card. We'll contact the prize winner after the event. And you, of course, must also meet the actual tech media prize policy. So we encourage your questions during the presentation and of course, at the end during our Q&A session. And speaking of expert presenters, it's now time to introduce you to Mr. Sean McElhenney, Oracle Solutions Architect at Rubrik, uh, who is going to be presenting today. Sean, it's great to have you on. Thank you, David. I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Take it away, Sean. All right. Well, today we're going to... Uh be talking to you a little bit about DR with modern data management and modern data protection. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and listen in. Um, we're going to cover a few concepts in the webinar, but the main area of focus is going to be defining de disaster recovery, identifying how it impacts you, uh, defining modern data management or modern data protection, and then identifying the role that modern data protection can play in disaster recovery. So. Let's talk about DR. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson made a pretty clear statement on the impact of nature. And it just really clarifies that, you know, you don't have to be an astrophysicist to perform disaster recovery. But there are times that it might help. Now, details on DR. Sometimes disaster recovery is confused with high availability. There's two concepts that have interdependencies um, but they're not codependent. There's a key distinction between HA and DR. HA focuses on failures of components within a data center, while DR deals with failure of the data center. But they do share one common goal. That's minimizing unplanned downtime. <clears throat> if it's managed properly, it can even be leveraged to minimize required downtime too. So, why do we care about DR? As technologists, we own the infrastructure. So if something goes down, it's our problem. And downtime costs money. So if you aren't focusing on meeting your consumer's availability requirements, you're costing them money. The service level agreement is a critical component for any DR solution. Your business owners must be able to articulate their requirements, and that ranges from performance to availability. An SLA has to have tangible metrics if it's to be of any value, and ultimately the system owners have to agree to those terms. I'm pretty sure most of you are acutely aware of this, but if your system 
doesn't have a formal SLA, there's no way to validate your system expectations. You'll be held accountable to the whims of other parties. So the SLA should dictate your DR requirements because DR sites cost money. So how can you plan for the worst and still be fiscally responsible? DR sites break down into four general approaches. You have a cold site that has physical location, possibly copies of the backups, uh, lacks hardware and software most likely, and it tends to be one of the most affordable DR options for you. The cool site will have a physical location. It'll have hardware on the floor, which may or may not be up to date, might have backups, might have networking, might have the software installs. And, you know, now that you've dropped hardware into the mix, your prices are starting to rise. The warm site is the physical site, the hardware's online, software's installed, you have backups, may not be synchronized with production, so some level of recovery may be required to bring the environment to the correct point in time. But in reality, these solutions are starting to engage vendor-specific technologies like Data Guard for Oracle or getting into availability groups for SQL Server. And since we're starting to integrate vendor-specific tooling, and we have another system online, that all has to be licensed. So now costs are starting to ramp up significantly. And lastly, we've got the hot site. It has all the features of the warm site, plus it has log sync utilities to ensure near real-time mirroring of production data. You know, of course, there may be some log apply lag either by design, so that you can prevent propagation of uh, corrupt data, or due to network throughput rates. But now that you're leveraging the flagship high availability and DR functionality of your database vendor, these really start amping up the licensing costs and start to really come in at a premium cost wise. So Oracle has assembled their own spin on HADR with their maximum availability architecture. Now SQL Server offers similar features <clears throat> but doesn't have the formalized architecture framework that Oracle assembled. So if you look at the general layout of the features and functionality, you see how it readily maps from, you know, cold on the left all the way over to hot on the right. And if you're familiar with Oracle licensing, you're painfully aware of how quickly licensing costs ramps ramp up as you work toward the hot or platinum solution. Bear with me a moment while I grab a quick drink. Sorry about that. Now, we've talked a little bit about DR, so let's look at modern data protection and the role that it can play in DR solutions. So MacArthur made it pretty clear that there's no security on this earth, right? So you've got to figure out who you want to give your opportunities to. Do you want to give them to your customers or do you want to give them to malicious actors? So what is modern data protection? Term's been thrown around quite a bit lately. What you as a consumer should really be assessing when you're looking at solutions touting this term, first and foremost, is you need the ability to protect your data wherever it resides, whether it's in your data center or the cloud, in a series of files or in a database. It shouldn't lock you into a specific vendor or technology. It should be flexible enough to leverage native application toolings and not reinvent the wheel. We all know data is growing exponentially, so the ability for a solution to scale to meet this need is absolutely critical. And we need to be able to reduce the complexity in the learning curve by providing a single pane of glass view of your protected objects and a consistent look and feel across the solution. The ability for, of a product to meet or exceed industry standard security and appliance requirements is pretty important. And the solution really has to be resilient. Your protected objects should be retrievable from your local site, a DR site, the cloud, or anywhere in between for that matter. Uh, CI/CD methodologies really require tooling that can be easily automated and integrated into your existing tool sets. 
you should really be looking for API first solutions to enable this kind of functionality. <clears throat> and your tooling should be capable of easing your transition to the cloud. You, you may not be there yet, but odds are it's on somebody's radar in your organization. And lastly, it should really be able to handle your recovery needs with ease. So knowing what to look for out of modern data protection solutions is quite important, but what role can they play with DR specifically? It's not unrealistic to expect a modern solution to provide assistance in the following areas. Should be able to augment your existing DR solution. It should be able to synchronize backups across sites. It shouldn't break any of your existing configurations. And it doesn't have complex configuration requirements to integrate into these solutions or require substantial training to use it, use it effectively. We really want to keep it super simple. Ideally, these, this type of solution should help make your DR solutions bulletproof. So let's dig a little deeper into these concepts. So your SLA should dictate the availability requirements of your solution. This will place you somewhere on a spectrum from no DR solution to a secondary production site. Depending on where you fall, a modern data protection solution can provide varying benefits. We'll assess this based on general DR concepts and not dig into a particular vendor's offering. So if we look at a cold site, you'll see that you'll have your backups available, but not much else. A modern data protection approach could support this in a few different ways. If the sites are on the network, you may have an archival location to find at the cold site, so backups can be shipped there. If it's not readily network accessible, backups can be archived to a device that can be accessed either physically, like a tape, or via network, uh, like a cloud storage bucket. Now, cool sites have hardware on the floor and backups are available. If the network's online at this site, your modern data protection solution should support a replication configuration. This will enable your production MDP to replicate copies of backups to the DR site. It should also enable you to define how long you want to retain the replicated backups at the DR site. You know, example, if you're storing your backups at your production site and shipping them out for archival, long-term retention at the DR site will add a lot of cost but not provide a lot of value. So lastly, you know, your MDP needs to be able to perform recovery fast. Once the hardware is visible to the modern data protection solution, it should be capable of restoring all of your components in your DR solution, virtualization, OS, application binaries, and databases. All right, so the warm DR site is where you really start to see some of these expenses increase significantly. The site's online, leverages vendor-specific software components to keep the DR site in a relatively synchronized state with production. Um, so, a modern data protection solution may appear to provide diminishing value here as your vendor solution is doing the heavy lifting to minimize the downtime in case of a DR event. But an MDP should be able to offload backups to the D, production backups to the DR site in this configuration or provide a cost effective alternative to keep your DR site relatively synchronized with production. Now, hot sites mean your solution simply can't afford to be down. Odds are good you're gonna be leveraging all the top dollar availability offerings your vendor provides. Again, your MDP may appear to provide less value here, but it should certainly be able to enable backups from the secondary site and ultimately give you additional peace of mind. So I'm sure you figured out by now that um, a modern data protection or MDP solution provides the most bang for the buck with cold and cool sites. 
the real value an MDP should be able to provide in this scenario is automating the recovery at the DR site. Whether the requirement be to integrate with a third party software package to manage the recovery efforts or integrating into your custom scripts to expedite your recovery, an MDP should support this with ease. But what if your DR site is cloud based? A viable MDP must be able to not only replicate or archive your backups to your vendor's archives or your vendor's object storage bucket, but it should also have a mechanism to convert those backups into cloud usable images when necessary. Another area of value is innovation. I mentioned the cloud earlier. The cloud provides us with a platform for rapid prototyping and development, which enables a much faster innovation. You should expect nothing less from an MDP. Intuitive solutions and continuous integrations through the product offering, whether that be on-prem, cloud, or both. But the biggest value really doesn't fit on this slide. It's security. It's rapidly becoming the largest disruptor of business continuity. Unlike natural disasters or production site events, ransomware can't be thwarted by geographically distributing DR sites. Why? Well, let's walk through it really quick. There's a variety of attack vectors at play, whether it be malware, hackers, spyware, viruses, and trojans as a few examples. Many of these attack vectors contain ransomware that sits silently on your network collecting data and potentially analyzing your system. This enables ransomware to maximize its blast radius as it learns where your key data is and quietly propagates itself across your network. If your DR site is attached to this network, it's also exposed. At some point, the ransomware gets activated and data will likely be stolen and local data gets encrypted in an effort to double extort its victims. And ultimately your system goes into meltdown. So how can you solve this problem? Air gap backup media is something that people claim will work well, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't quite cover it. It still has to come online with read write access at some point, and that's when it can potentially be exposed to ransomware. Your best bet is an immutable backup. This enables the backups to be written once and then it can't be modified. This eliminates the ability to encrypt your backup files as the encryption process would force the backup to be altered in some fashion. And since the backup now exists on read-only media, that can't happen. So let's review quickly where modern data protection solutions can add value to your DR solution. It can greatly increase the efficiency in DR scenarios for cold and cool sites. It should be able to easily integrate with existing warm and hot site solutions from software vendors. It should provide mechanisms to easily automate standard DR tasks should have intuitive integration with major cloud providers. And, you know, technology continues to improve. So should your modern data protection provider. And when you have a disaster, no matter the source, you need to know your solution provides security at the point of your data. So now that you've received some information on how modern data protection solutions should integrate with a DR environment. I'm going to take some time to walk through how Rubrik can actually support this. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, if you have questions, there's no such thing as a bad question. Use the Q&A feature, get them out there. We'll do everything we can to make sure they're addressed. I think we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A on this. Okay. I got to switch one thing around here on my other screen. Here we go. All right, let's get logged in. There we go. Okay. Now, we talked earlier about how SLAs are so incredibly important for defining your, your DR requirements. 
rubric uses the concept of an SLA domain, which is very similar to how an organization would leverage an SLA. You feed the system your requirements, and then you tell it, go out and meet these requirements. So in this scenario, I can build out an SLA and say that I need my backups. You know, I need one backup a day. I need to retain it for 31 days. I need a monthly backup after month end close, for example, that I need to hang on to for two years. And then I have, you know, my year end backup that I have to hold on for five years for audit requirements. Pretty basic stuff. Now, this is where the DR component really starts to take shape. We're now getting into two key features here. We start talking about archival, which I can enable here. And archiving will let me dictate where I want to push this data out to after a point in time. Within this environment, we actually have um, all the major cloud providers we support defined. So for this example, we'll go with AWS and an S3 bucket. I can say that I want to go to this S3 bucket. I can determine the tiering that I want to use within S3. So I could specifically state that, yeah, you know what, push this out to deep archive so I get maximum compression at minimum cost. Or I could go to the opposite extreme and say, yep, just put the backups out there and then let the smart tiering within AWS slowly phase these out into deeper compression formats. Now, storing your archives costs money. So where is it going to be, where's your money gonna be best spent? Is it going to be keeping it on all the local hardware within say rubric for the five year retention period that you have for your longest backup? Or are you better off saying, you know what, I think I only need to hold on to my backups locally for 90 days. Then I can push them out to archival storage. That way I can keep that space free on my local storage for other backup purposes. Okay. Now, another feature. If you have requirements where once the backups cut it instantly, you have to have another copy elsewhere, you can enable the instant archive here. So that instead of just waiting for the 90 days, it's going to push a copy of it out there immediately. So that way you've got two copies of your backups at any point in time. One that's going to exist out in your archival bucket, and one that's going to exist on the brick for the 90 days. So let's say we were talking with some of the cool sites and whatnot where you may have um, a replication target. So if I have another rubric cluster that exists at my DR site, I can specify that here and then say, all right, how long do I want to maintain a copy of these backups at that target? Uh, obviously, you know, backup space and storage costs money. So the long, older a backup is, the less value it has. So do you really want to keep a backup out on your DR site that's 30 days old? Is it really going to give you much value at that point? Probably not. So you might be able to say, scroll down to uh, size this down to say 10 or 15 day retention. So now this would replicate the backups once they're complete from my source, which is a mare two in this example, and push a copy of it out to a mare one. I would click next here, then it tells me everything that I've got configured. And then what I've done now is once that's done, I have an overarching SLA policy that can be applied at an object level as compared to specifically protecting something for databases, you know, doing up a series of custom RMAN scripts, um, something for VMware specific snapshot configuration. This is an overarching concept to protect any object that you've defined within rubric. Now, 
let's look at what that means as far as how it works. If I go like this, I remember what my database name is. There it is. So here's a database that I have protected. There we go. So you can see that it's replicating the logs and it's uploading to my bucket. And now if I go over to Amer01, now you can see that I've got Amer1 here and Amer2 here. If I go into Amer1, I should be able to find this database here. There's my database name and look, you'll see it says that it's remote. So that means that it's just replicated backups. So now theoretically, I am in my DR site and I can come in here and say, okay, here's when my last backup was taken. Here's where I need to recover to. Now I can either use our live mount functionality where I'm using compute resources in my DR and DR site and serving up my data files off of rubric, or I can do a fully hydrated clone of the environment into my DR site just by coming in, going to my, my uh, replication brick, selecting my database, selecting the point in time I want to recover and then saying clone. Very easy to do. Now, one of the big things that I had referenced earlier was talking, I want to actually do this from Amer too, was talking about pushing the archivals out to the cloud and then being able to convert those over to an actual cloud image. If I come into my VMs, I can come in and select this host now, this is the host that my database is running on, right? You'll see here that I have the ability to configure this for cloud conversion. So that means when it pushes that archival copy out to the cloud in my S3 bucket, I can turn this on and submit it, and it will create an AMI of that backup. So that way, if I need to spin up an image quickly in Amazon, I can spin the image up with this and then go in and restore my database backup, which is also being pushed out to the same bucket and bring my DR solution online in the cloud. All with a few clicks and very little specialized training to get there. So very simple stuff and really that's the crux of how we can help you manage your DR solution and try to do it in a cost-effective manner for you. Um, that's really it as far as the presentation goes. And I'm more than willing to uh, go into Q&A at this point. Let me actually mention one thing before we do. We have our forward conference coming up in another, what is it, next week or two weeks? In two weeks. Um, please go out, register for it. You can attend the conference for free, but you'll also be able to get a lot of last year's content from the same page. Uh, lots of information coming up about some of the new features that are coming up in our next release. Uh, a credible group of speakers from, from various organizations. I think you'll be thrilled with some of the information that'll be coming out of that. So please, if you have time, Check it out. I think it'll be well worth your while. And, you know, can't thank you enough for the time. I appreciate it. Hope you guys have a great afternoon. And let's get to Q&A. Absolutely. Yeah, great presentation. I love the live demo. Thank you for taking time to do that. I know it uh, takes a little extra time and some extra stress maybe, but it's so valuable to see the product here in action and i mean rubric has just a really beautiful user interface it looks very easy to use so thanks for sharing that while we do our q a i'm just going to bring up this poll question for everyone out there that says what additional information would you like about the rubric solution and we'll just leave that up while we take your questions 
I want to remind everyone, of course, about our best question prize as well for a $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, as Sean said, there are no dumb questions. So if you have a question on your mind, you're kind of wondering, hey, does it do this? Does it do that? Or how does this work? Uh, now's the time to drop it there in the questions pane. So uh, let's see, first question on the list for you, Sean, they're asking, um, is there a way to test the backup after it's complete without going through a time consuming full restore test? Short answer is yes. Um, depending on what particular database you're protecting, um, and we look at Rubrik views backup and recovery as protection, not backup and recovery. <laughs> so um, you'll hear me use protect synonymous with backup and recovery quite often. What you've got is in an Oracle solution within Rubrik, um, you have the ability to automate the uh, the R man validate feature, so it will go through and do an R man validation and ensure that you've got a viable backup. The other option you have, I mentioned and showed the uh, some of the stuff for our live mount feature. What that does is live mount really takes and does that full restore in a fraction of the time because it doesn't have to move any of the data files. It's simply using the compute resources on the host that you define, and then it's serving up the data files from the rubric appliance itself. So you're not transferring files back and forth and getting it reintegrated back into the database. It's just saying, okay, I've got a new location for my data files. They're out on the brick. Give me the database. We've been seeing performance rates for multi terabyte databases, um, bringing a live mount online in minutes. Um, I think the last one I worked with was a four some odd four terabyte plus database, and we had it online in under eight minutes. Very impressive for such a, a large data set. So uh, good to know. Thank you for answering that one. Uh, next question I have here on the list, they're asking uh, who's responsible for the creation and maintenance of the cloud archival buckets? That's the great thing, I think, with Rubrik, is Rubrik is actually letting you manage that. We're not into owning your data. You want to make sure that that you've got it. You've got it in the buckets that you want, the configuration that you want. So all you have to do is you create the buckets the way you want them, and then you essentially link that into Rubrik. Say, okay, here's my bucket name. Here's the information you need to be able to get to it, and you're off to the races. Now you've got an S3 bucket, as an example, defined in your configuration that you can select as part of your SLA. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And then uh, here, this question they're asking, or they're commenting first, ransomware doesn't attack Linux or Unix systems. Why would I spend my money protecting something that can't be attacked? Uh, what's your take on that? Well, believe it or not, that can't be farther from the truth at this point. Um, ransomware, granted, is just proliferated through Windows environments, but it's really starting to take hold in some Linux environments and especially like in some of the ESXIs for the virtualization environments. So trying to keep up with all the patches and whatnot can be difficult. And that's where these exploits are taking hold. So if we're not on top of those, then we run into issues and enabling rubric to go out there and say, okay, let's make sure that we've got this immutable backup there so that in the event you are compromised, you know, whether you think it's going to happen or not, um, it's probably the best safety net you'll ever have. A uh, quick Google search will, will show you if you go ransomware Linux or ransomware ESXi, it will show you a ton of information on on variants that are out there that are actually attacking these environments. And I think we're just going to see that number increase exponentially uh, in the next year or so as you know, ransomware gets more and more pro blah, 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 easy for me to say proliferated. <laughs> <laughs> 
Excellent. Yeah. And there's a question here uh, related to ransomware from Bradford about uh, what does Rubrik do to protect or what can we do with the rubric to protect the backup data itself? Um, is there a way to make the backup data immutable? Now, clarification when you're saying backup data, are you talking about, if we're talking about the physical backups, everything that's going on in that chain from the point in time that rubric issues the command to start a backup to the point that it's pushed out to our immutable storage is all going on on an encrypted channel. So if you think about the primary goal of, of ransomware, it's going to be to encrypt your data so you can't um, use it. Now, from a database perspective, the ability to have a backup that can't be modified is huge because there's your guaranteed recovery point. So if it's encrypted when the backup's getting taken, that means it can't be modified in transit. It's put on storage that's right once, keep forever. So then it can't be modified once it's on the system. That means that even if ransomware, you were subject to a ransomware attack and they, by some mystical way, were able to access the backup media, they wouldn't be able to modify those files because of the way that they're saved off. So you would always have that immutable copy available to you. Okay, that's smart, very smart. Uh, there's a question here from Jamie about, uh, is does Rubrik have a single point of uh, management or ma single management interface? Uh, and then second part of that is, what about automation? What are the options there? Okay, so the big thing with Rubrik is it's API first. So everything that you saw me going through the screen with um, is an API call. And depending on what actions you want to take, you can easily build the API calls out for, say, if you're doing um, scripted automation, uh, like homegrown stuff on your own end, or if you have uh, an orchestration tool that you leverage. Mentioned earlier, uh, before we started the presentation, there was build.rubric.com that was brought up. Out there, you'll see, actually, you know what? Let me see if I can pull that up quick. Sure, okay. yeah, and we we put this link in the handouts tab as well. I wanna let everyone know, but I, I do see your screen. Yeah, so you can see if you've got like Ansible, Terraform, things like that, we've got integrations readily built for that. So you can come out here, you can grab that integration point and start leveraging it within the tool set that you use. If you're a Windows shop and you do a lot of PowerShell based work, pull down the PowerShell SDK. Pull down the Python SDK if you want to use that. Um, we've got all of that stuff here. And if you've got specific use cases that you know you think maybe other people could use, it's all in here and it can walk you through, oh, hey, somebody was asking about backup validation. Wow, yeah, here's one with PowerShell right there. So now you've got a use case there to actually walk through it. Um, it's really slick stuff. And then we also have beyond this, there's a GitHub repository that has all sorts of open source code leveraging these various SDKs and whatnot that you can go out, grab, pull down, and gives you a starting point to do some other crazy stuff. Um, the other thing that comes with every rubric deployment is the concept of a sandbox. So you'll see here that this is my URL for my rubric appliance. And then I just modified the extension on it. So now my URI is taking me to uh, our, what we call our API playground or the API Explorer. And now depending on what I use, I do a lot of Oracle work. So I can come in here and go to Oracle. And now I can see all the major calls that Rubrik makes to do Oracle features. So I can grab all of that from here 
and build it out. So if I want to know, you know, anything like host information, I could come in here. All I need to know is the ID of the host object. And I can come out. The cool thing with this is if I authorize, so I log in through here, I can click on try it out. I can feed the host in there, click execute. Not only will I see the JSON string and the result, it'll show me the exact build out that I need to do, say for like a curl command, if I wanted to execute this on my own. So it's really, really powerful. And we're really trying to make sure you have the tooling you need to be able to do this with relative ease. Uh, the other thing we offer is let's say you've got a pretty complex scenario and you're not quite sure how to how to make it work. Um, that's where a lot of our professional services team can come in, help understand where you're at, where you want to go and work with you to get you where you need to be. Very nice. It, it's amazing. Um, all the different automations there that are available. It's a really powerful um, you know, capability that you all have there, the API first model with all those integrations. So um, let's see, lots more questions coming in. Uh, of course, don't forget about our best question prize. And let's see, let's move on now to the next question. They're asking about um, security. Uh, they, Heather says she works in a healthcare environment. And of course they have uh, regulatory requirements. Can rubric help? or can rubric uh, meet the, those types of requir requirements uh, relating to compliance and security? Uh, the short answer, <laughs> I'm going, I come from a consulting background. So this type of, this type of question always makes me antsy um, because there are so many ways to answer it wrong. <laughs> but the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, we have a lot of healthcare customers that, you know, have some major concerns around ransomware, how to protect it, how to make sure uh, HIPAA compliance and PHI compliance and everything are all in place. If you want to learn more about specifics around the uh, the level of protections we provide, feel free to go out to uh, to rubric.com and and look up some of the information there. You'll find a lot more detail than than I could ever give you here. Got it. Okay. Very fair. And then next question, you know, you talked about the cloud archivals. The question here from Daniel is kind of how, how does a uh, rubric interact with the cloud? I'm thinking really of the, the configuration initially, at least, uh, for example, would you go out first to say AWS and create some sort of repository that this data is going to be stored in or how does that work? Okay. With what we were showing today, the, um, oh, and also if you look at, uh, I'm not sure if, if this went out to the entire group, but uh, just had a post for one of the internal sites or one of the external sites for uh, information for Heather. Um, David, I'm not sure if you can, can copy that over so that everybody can see it. Sure. I'll post that now. And thank you. Now, what we've got as far as the backups concerned, we aren't actually taking our on-site backup and pushing that directly to the cloud. The on-site backups are all happening within your, um, I'm gonna say data center. So it's all happening there and within Rubrik. So Rubrik's going to be making the call from the, uh, the Rubrik cluster out to your host to execute a series of activities make sure that the backup is cut. Once that backup is cut, you start looking at archival. Now that's where you've gone into rubric and configured that specific archival bucket, right? And let's see if I can show you that again quick. Once you have that archival bucket defined, you can then go into your SLA configuration and specify that bucket name. So if I come to my SLAs, go here, 
Here's one of the AWS buckets. Let me go to configure, we'll go to edit, and here. So you'll see here is where I defined that bucket. So it could be changed to whatever else we have, right? So once we define the bucket in the configuration, then it's going to become available here for use with archival. Does that answer the question? Or are you looking at something a little more upstream as far as how does it work? It does. I, th I think that answers the question uh, perfectly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question, uh, Jared is asking about uh, when it comes to ransomware recovery, or really, I would think it applies to any sort of high speed recovery. Um, would Rubrik have an on site repository of the data, you know, to perform some sort of high speed recovery? Or, you know, would that data be stored in the cloud, which you potentially could take a little bit longer to recover back on site? What's your take on that? <laughs> well, that's a very good point. Um, Rubrik is the way with what I was playing with here, it gives you the option of either or. Okay. So if you have a physical DR site, um, and we'll look at, we can even look at this window here, you'll see that we've got replication happening. Okay. So that means that those backups that you're taking locally are getting replicated over to your DR site. In addition to that, you also have this archival policy. And that is what's pushing a copy of those backups out to the cloud for long-term retention. So if you are not a cloud customer per se, and you just want a cheap storage bucket to, to meet your archival requirements so that you can retain your backups for however long you need to without having to have an entire six racks of storage set up to hold on the backups, this is where that option you know, this is where, where this really starts showing some real value because you can throw it out to, you know, I, I use throw it out rather, <laughs> might not be the best term to use, but you, you get the idea. I can throw it out to an S3 bucket that longer term will cost me a lot less than having to keep a bunch of copies of it on local disk. So I can still have the replicated copy that goes out to, my, my DR site, a local copy that I keep for a specified period of time on my primary, and then ultimately the copy that I push out to the cloud for long-term storage. Excellent, excellent. And see, I like this question, what makes Rubrik the best option in your opinion? You know, of course, especially around database protection, our, our topic of today. Um, I was an Oracle DBA prior to coming on board with Rubrik for about 25 years. And I haven't seen anything quite as, uh, I hate to use the word slick, um, but it's the first thing that comes to mind that's, you know, easy and intuitive and functional. Um, so many of the vendors that I've seen get really invasive with how they interact with the Oracle database where all of a sudden you're going out and you're creating all these extra schemas just to support your backup application. It's really painful. Rubrik takes a much simpler approach of, okay, yeah, let me know where your binaries exist on this host and who owns them. And then I'll take the ball from there. Then we're going to look at that SLA to say, okay, how often do you want a backup taken? How long do you want to retain it? And then when do you want your log backups? So like when I, when I look at this, let me show you a quick from an Oracle database perspective. And I've got to learn how to spell. Here we go. So I can come in here, right? And if I've got a host where I'm protecting multiple data, where I might have multiple databases online, you know, or I'm bringing more databases up, I can physically protect the host and tell anything that's created, tell it so that, yeah, if you create any new databases on this host, automatically protect those with the SLA I've assigned to the host. So that means that with this demo SLA I have here, if I spin up new databases, 
on my L4 host, those databases are automatically going to be protected. So now I no longer have to make sure I've got my own personal workflow that says, okay, well, you know, my team of 20 DBAs have say 10 databases that we're getting ready to spin up and we know they're coming online at different times and what hosts are they going on? And now I've got to stay on top of all that, coordinating all that activity. It's just a matter of, all right, well, we know we've got new databases coming up on hosts one, two, and three. Do we have those protected within rubric? Do we have them set so that the SLA is inherited to anything that gets spun up on that host? And then call it a day. Know that it's gonna have some minimal level of protection. And in the event that once the database is online, if I discover that, you know what, yeah, I actually need to get more granular with how I'm protecting this database, I can come into the database itself and change those protection options. So I can say, yeah, you know what, I don't want it to have the same one as the host. I actually need it to do a different SLA. Or it can have the same SLA, but I actually need to be able to change how often it's doing my archive log backups. So I have that level of flexibility to be able to manage that. And that's, that's one of the best things that I've seen with it is from just a protection standpoint, it's not a lot of heavy lifting on my end. Um, you know, recovery is a whole different ball of wax for a DBA because you know i know there's a lot of dbas out there myself included that are quite ocd <laughs> when it comes to recovery exercises and you have a way you want stuff done uh, but knowing that i've got a tool that is getting me those backups consistently safely and securely i feel a lot safer the other thing that really sold me with rubric was this live mount feature. The fact that I can come in, select a point in time, and simply go, bang, I want to mount it, select the host I want to mount it to. If I have parameters I need to provide because, say, my Oracle homes are different or I've got to resize my SGA, I can do that here. Click mount, or if I'm doing an API call, I can do it that way. And it's done in minutes. When I started seeing that with multi-terabyte databases coming back to me in under 10 minutes, it blew my mind. You know, so it's like, okay, so wait a second. You know, when I'm looking at a great use case is with auditing. Um, when auditors come in and they need to, you know, you need to be able to prove that you can restore a backup from this point in time in your recovery or your retention window to be able to say, oh, okay, yep, let's come in, click a button, bang, click mount, and you can give them that information on your 200 terabyte database in say 30 minutes or less, as compared to in two to three days, that just paid for itself in spades. <laughs> so that was those are just some of the crazy things that I see. And then the continuing improvement that's going on every release cycle is, is astounding. Excellent. I think that's a great place to wrap up here. We've got a number of more maybe technical questions that uh, you might be able to get back to after the event, but I know we're trying to keep this, you know, relatively short and concise. And uh, we've really seen the product in action backing up Oracle. I think this has been awesome. So thank you again for doing that demo. And thank you for taking so many questions from the audience. Um, with that, if you want to go ahead and stop your screen share, there you go. Um, I want to remind everyone to respond to the poll question you see there on the screen. And uh, Sean, thanks so much for being on the event. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And for all the mothers out there, I hope everybody has a happy Mother's Day. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to the audience, of course, for joining us and for all the excellent questions. I do want to announce the winner now of our $300 Amazon gift card. That's going out to... Cherry Rumley from Georgia. Congratulations. Uh, maybe it's actually Sherry, Sherry Rumley from Georgia. Congratulations. We'll reach out to deliver that gift card. We'll also be contacting our best question prize winner as well. 
I want to remind everyone once again to visit rubric rubric.com and build.rubric.com for more information on how to simplify disaster recovery of your enterprise databases with modern data management. Have a great day and have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.